good morning and welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started to keep us on time. I know we're at the start of our conference today. There are lots of meaty sessions, this one in particular. So thank you very much for joining us today to talk about the opioid epidemic. Um, we're here to learn about the scope of the problem and some of the root causes and potential promising solutions that you can think about as you go back to your own communities and the work that you're doing through your philanthropy. I'm going to begin by briefly introducing myself and talking about the work of the Richard M. Fairbanks Foundation in opioids. Then I'm going to introduce our panelists, and then each of them are going to get up and talk for about seven to eight minutes um, on, on three different topics. Then we'll have some facilitated conversation here with the panel, and then we'll leave time at the end for Q&A. And just a reminder that this is a recorded session, so if you ask questions, it will be memorialized. Um, my name is Claire Fidian Green, and I have the great privilege of serving as pres president and CEO of the Richard M. Fairbanks Foundation, which is a city-based private foundation with a little over $300 million in assets. And our mission is to advance the vitality of Indianapolis and the well-being of its people. One of our three focus areas is health. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. My professional experience spans the corporate, nonprofit, and public sectors in education, health, and the life sciences. And prior to coming to the foundation in January of 2015, I was Governor Mike Pence's education policy advisor. So very much had that perspective of the public sector and the role the public sector can play, and then the very important role that the corporate and philanthropic and nonprofit sectors play. And I think we all need to play a role when it comes to the opioid epidemic. So hopefully you'll hear that from our panelists today and through our conversation. So when I joined the foundation uh, in January of 2015, I led the board through a visioning process um, to really take a look at the big challenges and opportunities facing the city of Indianapolis. That happened to coincide with the, the national attention. There was a New York Times article and others on the HIV outbreak in Scott County, which is a small rural community in southern Indiana. And that was directly resulted from sharing dirty needles from injecting crushed opioids, the painkiller Opana, um, which led to this big spike in HIV. So as we talked to public health experts about Indianapolis and business leaders and others, we were really stunned to find out that this wasn't just a problem in a small rural community. It was impacting our city and, in fact, the entire state and, of course, the rest of the country. So that got our board's attention. And when we adopted new funding priorities at the, in late 2015, we decided we would try to tackle the opioid crisis. So the first thing that we did was to commission a study um, because we knew that we wanted to support evidence-based programs, um, some innovative new programs if there weren't any solutions that currently existed. We wanted to help raise awareness, but we didn't, we didn't know what we didn't know. So we commissioned a study from the Richard M. Fairbanks School of Public Health in Indianapolis, which our foundation helped to create. Um, on the scope of the problem in Marion County and our state. And there were really three recommendations that came out of that that I think would apply to your states um, as well. The first is we just weren't doing enough on prevention, and that was school-based prevention. It was prevention for providers who prescribe medications. It was employers making sure they had good benefits programs for their employees. And we're identifying those employees that were struggling with addiction and getting them into treatment. The second was harm reduction. So if somebody is an addict and they're doing like they did in Scott County and sharing dirty needles, um, then you need to make sure you are providing harm reduction services. Naloxone, which provides people who've overdosed, syringe exchanges, take back events. There's lots of ways to reduce harm. And then the third category, and this remains a huge challenge for our state, and I'm sure it is uh, in yours as well, is expanding access to treatment for people struggling from addiction. So those were the, the three big buckets. I will tell you our, our board looked at this and said, well, not, now what do we do? This is a little overwhelming. Um, so we decided that we were going to uh, convene a summit for other funders in Indiana and when we released this report, it was last September, we convened funders from all around the state, um, community foundations, private foundations, hospital foundations, and it didn't matter if they focused on health or not because they were seeing the impact of opioid addiction in youth programs and employment programs. So we said, this is 
impacting all of us, let's get together and learn um, about what is the problem and, and what can we potentially do together. And our, our genuine belief as a foundation is that we would be much more effective at combating complex issues like the opioid epidemic if we're working together with other funders and across sectors. Um, so that was really um, why we, we pulled that group together. And then since last year, we have been making some grants, and I'm just gonna highlight two things um, that we've done. This is an example of a grant that our foundation awarded to a program that was actually created at the request of Indiana's Department of Child Services. They have seen a big spike in the number of children being removed from their families because of the opioid addiction and other substances, but the opioids is really driving the spike. And they were worried because there aren't enough foster families to take in those children. So they said, let's try another approach. Um, let's actually keep children with their mothers, pregnant women, um, let's get them into counseling, and then do 24-17 intensive parenting skills. Um, so having the children with the mothers helps motivate them to stay into treatment and remain on the journey of recovery, uh, but also you know, isn't as disruptive to those children. And that address that issue of just not having enough capacity of, of foster families. Um, another grant, which I didn't include up here, that we just made recently, um, it was a little controversial with our own board. It was to Gannett, the for-profit media company, which runs the Indianapolis Star, the paper in our town. And we decided to fund a year-long series um, on the opioid epidemic. And the controversy was around funding a for-profit entity. But we decided that the reach of the Indianapolis Star was very important. And of course, we exercise expenditure responsibility for the technocrats in the room um, to make that possible as a, a grant. And then following that summit, we surveyed everybody. We said, do you want to continue to get together and meet? Is that going to be helpful for you? And we got an overwhelmingly positive response. So we launched a, a funders collaborative in Indiana, again, all around the state, different types of funders. And we decided to include our public sector colleagues. So we have um, Jerome Adams, before he changed jobs, um, but said the head of our state health department, the head of our F uh, Family Service Social Administration, which oversees Medicaid, and is also administering the federal grant that Indiana received um, to attack the opioid crisis, and others in the state, so that we could all learn together. And we're starting to move to identifying potential opportunities to collaborate around the state. There's more information on our website. Happy to talk to anyone um, if you're interested in the work that we're doing. Now I'm going to briefly introduce our, our panelists, and then before I turn it over to uh, Dr. Jarris, I'm also going to set the stage for our conversation uh, today. So first we have Dr. Paul Jarris, who is the Chief Medical Officer at the March of Dimes. As you see in your program materials with his longer biography, he's got a very uh, extensive experience and will bring a wealth of knowledge to this conversation today. He previously served as Executive Director of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, um, ASHTO, I believe, ASHTO. Um, and prior to that, he was the Commissioner of Health for the State of Vermont. Then we have Dr. Kara Christ, she is with our host state, Arizona. She is the director of Department of Health Services, and she has been working closely under the dire direction of Governor Ducey to attack the opioid crisis here in Arizona. And then finally, on the far right, we have Alexa Eggleston. She's senior program officer with the Conrad and Hilton Foundation. The Hilton Foundation has funded substance abuse prevention for decades, and so she will provide um, some very helpful perspectives from a funder who's been all over the United States about the work that they're doing. So before I turn it over to Dr. Jarris, um, again, just want to set the stage for this crisis and, and why we're talking about it today. The opioid epidemic um, has received a lot of attention nationally and, and for good, re good reason. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says that since 1999, the number of overdose deaths involving opioids, which includes prescription drugs, heroin, and synthetic, synthetic opioids like fentanyl has quadrupled. From 2000 to 2015, more than half a million people have died from drug overdoses, and 91 Americans die every day from an opioid overdose. And we now know that overdoses are, uh, from prescription opioids are a driving factor in this big increase. And in fact, the amount of prescription opioids sold to pharmacies, hospitals, and doctor's offices also quadrupled for that same period, 1999 to 2010. And yet, Americans have not seen a decline in the pain that they're experiencing. 
There was also a recent paper, um, some of you might have seen, from Princeton economist Alan Kruger, who noted that participation in the labor force has been declining for prime age men, ages 25 to 54, for decades. However, what was very interesting is that almost half of that group of men who are not participating in the labor force take pain medication on a daily basis. And two thirds of those who take the pain medication are, are taking prescription opioids. And then even more troubling, he found that labor force participation for prime age men has fallen more in areas where there are higher rates of prescribing opioid medications. So clearly this is a, a crisis of um, enormous consequences, not only of course the human toll, uh, the economic toll, and it really behooves us to all come together and work as effectively and efficiently as possible across sectors in, in my perspective. Um, it's also important to recognize that while we're talking about opioids, other substances are also a problem, of course, alcohol, methamphetamines. There might be other things that are more um, relevant in your communities. However, the solutions that we're going to talk about today really actually address those as well. So hopefully, um, for your community, this is a, a helpful conversation as well. So our panel is going to help us better understand the impact of the opioid crisis across the U.S. Uh, we will talk about the role that state government can play uh, from Dr. Christ. And then we will also hear from a philanthropist perspective about concrete steps that philanthropy can take, uh, can take to plug in, especially where there are holes in public sector funding. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Jarris. He is going to talk about uh, the root cause of the crisis, the toll it's taking, and then help us better understand addiction uh, and how it impacts the human brain. In eight minutes. <laughs> I think that was, that's actual torture. <laughs> Normally you have an hour to talk about this and it's a whole lot easier in an hour. But you know, I really appreciate your being here. This is such an important issue and, and that was a wonderful introduction, Claire. But th this is more than just a health issue, as, as you allude to there. This is an issue, uh, a societal issue for us. What we're seeing is this is affecting clearly health. This is affecting families. This is affecting child development. This is affecting education, the, the workforce where employers are struggling to uh, find people who can pass a drug test to work for them. It's affecting our national security as people uh, have difficulty getting into the military with drug use. And in fact, we're seeing that even within the military and the VA, they are very concerned with a number of um, soldiers that they have created addiction in. Um, so what I'm going to go through just briefly here is, is some more conceptual things rather than just giving you, I'll give you one or two awfulization slides to show you how bad it is, but I think you know that and that's why you're here. But really I think to think about it, how do you think about this issue? Um, and frankly I'd say there's nobody who truly understands the whole ecosystem of, of this. So this is something that comes out of the, of the quality improvement world, um, a guy named Paul Batalden. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. Our system in the United States is perfectly designed to get the opioid crisis we have. Every single part of it is, whether it's drug development, whether it's the approval process, whether it's the manufacturing, the distribution, the doctors and pharmacists who are engaged, the patients themselves, the, the way we conceptualize it for so many years is a law enforcement issue that we bust our way out of. It all lines up, and what's difficult about this is there's no single level. There is absolutely no silver bullet. Each time you make a move, you affect something else in the system, and it's really important to think about that. There's also, again, no single intervention. If you think of you know, the Swiss cheese analogy, every piece of cheese, the Swiss cheese, has a hole in it. But you put enough of them together, and there's no holes left. So we really have to make sure we take a very systematic approach to this uh, epidemic uh, and all around it. And here's my authorization slide. Um, as, you, as you all know by now, if you can see that, because I can't from here, um, we opioids have skyrocketed. Um, and opioid deaths have skyrocketed. It passed the peak gun deaths in this country, passed the uh, peak HIV deaths, passed the peak motor vehicle accidents. What does it take to become a societal issue? Right? We, we, the president today is probably going to announce um, a, that there will be a declaration of a public health emergency, and that's very helpful. That is not the same thing as a national emergency. It allows Health and Human Services to do a few things, including have access to the Public Health Emergency Fund. Who knows how much money is in the Public Health Emergency Fund? $57,000. 
<laughs> that could buy you a few oxys, I guess, not much more. So, um, also, the important thing to remember, this directly correlates with the sale of prescription opioids. So on the top there, you can look at the opi op opioid uh, deaths. Um, on the, the solid blue line, treatment admissions. Um, oh, excuse me, the dotted line on top is the, is, the, is the amount of prescriptions out there, the amount of drugs prescribed. Middle uh, is what's going on with treatment, uh, a death, and then treatment. So basically, when you look at crime, you look at addiction, you look at mental absence syndrome, incarceration, it correlates precisely with the flooding of prescription medicines onto the market. And, and again, the system lined that up perfectly, and we're all complicit in it. I'm a family doctor. I was practicing. Um, you, you still, as a doc, when you get raided by your patients, um, they ask you, has your doctor done everything possible to control your pain? What we should be going for is allowing someone to be functional with their pain, not to take it away. And yet, it could affect my status as a doc, my pay, if I don't do everything possible to satisfy and take care of the pain. So every aspect of this, the fifth vital sign was introduced, and the VA has reversed this. It said in addition to blood pressure, pulse, and these other things, uh, you scale your pain on a zero to one to 10. And every patient that comes in, we're gonna ask them, what's your pain level? And your job is to remove it. Pain is part of life, unfortunately. And, and really, we, we have a wrong conceptualization. So if you look here, um, the, the important point here is there is not a single, there's not a separate drug trade around prescription drugs from illicit and street drugs. It is one market, and it is a very dynamic market. If you crack down on opium or fentanyl, prescription drugs go up. You crack down on prescription drugs, fentanyl, heroin go up. It's one dynamic market, and we have to keep that in mind. The, um, so you can see all opioids there, and then you see the prescri commonly prescribed opioids and the skyrocketing there. Um, but look what happens down here. The synthetics, heroin, um, and more recently, um, fentanyl. Why did that happen? So 80% of uh, heroin users began with prescription drugs. And the other thing to remember is these aren't all bad actors. Okay, so I, I had a mount, race mountain bikes, broke my clavicle pretty badly. Within 10 days, I had been prescribed 210 Percocets by my doctors. Now, if I had taken them as a directed, I would have died. <laughs> Seriously, no, I would have overdosed, no question. And I would have been addicted. We do that all the time in medicine. You might be interested to know that there are no studies demonstrating the effectiveness of opioid pain medicines for chronic pain. In fact, there's even an FDA warning against it. And yet people get put on chronic opioids for chronic pain all the time. We create this epidemic. Great advertising, great marketing, pressure on the physicians, tons of money to be made. There's even a market now for drugs to take care of the problems of opioids. Have you seen the ads on TV about if you have constipation from your opioids? How about dealing with the opioids? So, you know, our system is lined up. So what happens here is all of a sudden we have cheap heroin. So you, you're up along here, you run out of money to continue buying prescription drugs, which can be, uh, the prescription drugs can be quite expensive. And, there, and so you can get a bag of heroin, depending on where you are, for four or five dollars, up to 20 or so, depending on the city. Um, so you have to earn money, so what you start doing is you substitute another opioid for the prescription opioid. It's exactly what happens. Oh, and by the way, do you give up your, getting your prescription opioids? Probably not. If you sell two pills a day, you can make between five and $21,000 a year. It helps you fund these over here. Or if you can't get a fix, you go to the doctor. Doctor turns you down, you come back over here. So it's important to remember this is one dynamic market. Um, and, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. So, oops, I'm going to run out of time so fast. So uh, fentanyl. Where does the synthetic fentanyl come from? Anybody know? OK. China, Mexico mostly, right? The same factories that produce the fentanyl we buy in the medical system sell fentanyl to the illegal market. The same factories that press the pills for prescription drugs that sell the presses, sell it to the illegal market. People can manufacture now drugs that look just like a prescription drug, press them with the same presses and sell them. Sell heroin, fentanyl from the same factories that make the legal fentanyl. 
this is a very complex uh, situation. So, um, so remember the, how dynamic it is. Also, we talk about death. Very important, stark, clearly identifiable. I was sitting, I got my coroner's report in 2003 when I was a health commissioner, and I called him up and said, this has got to be wrong. It says here that so many more people are dying from prescription drugs than heroin and cocaine and other drugs. He goes, no, that's just the way it is. But look at all these other people. Now, again, this is a very medical view. What you don't see up here are families are ruined because jobs are lost, children pulled away from their parents who go into to, um, custody, and what happens to those children that go into custody? Families split apart. There's so much more. HIV, like we saw in Indiana, so many other things here underneath that death. So remember, there's a lot more we're going for here to normalize our, our society and what's going on. So very quickly, like part of the dynamic is the environment. So in Vermont, North, there was a place called the Northeast Kingdom, very rural, used to be paper, paper mills and lumber, and uh, now there's nothing up there. And so you have a lot of kids with nothing to do. The cartels came up, the, the marketing folks, and they were selling threefers, two young adolescent girls, three packs of heroin for the price of one, and it had little stickers on it, like unicorns and whales and things like that. And they know that adolescents normalize their behavior by sharing with their friends. They get one, they give one kid a three of her, two other kids use. I saw a girl in my practice on Tuesday who would use for the first time on Thursday, was already having cravings. This stuff is so pure now. Um, so the environment makes a big difference here. Genes, there is a biological predisposition. Uh, here and there are some people who are very susceptible. Some people will say to you, the first time I felt normal in my whole life was when I took an opioid. There are receptor areas in the brain in those people where they don't produce enough dopamine. Um, so obviously the, dif the difference in the drugs, some are more rapidly addictive than others, um, but they're all addictive. And as far as the brain's concerned, it can't tell the difference between heroin, fentanyl, oxy, perks, or anything. It's the same chemical hitting the same receptors in the brain. And what you have to remember, this is a brain disease. This is not a moral disease. Those many people enter this because we prescribed them a drug as a physician for a pain they had. And it may have been legitimate at first, but within two weeks of taking your prescriptions as directed, you can start developing physical, physical dependence. Um, we can't just say to people, just get off it. It doesn't work. That's why you have to treat the changes in the brain. What happens is when you get a hit of these opioids, it releases tons of dopamine in the brain. And if you use the opioids for a period of time with a prescription or, 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 or illegal, your brain down-regulates and produces less dopamine. So therefore, you have less drive, you have less enjoyment, you're in pain constantly. And people treat the withdrawal and the pain. My brother has a very severe cancer right now. He was in lots of pain. He was taking his pre prescription uh, opioids for a while. And he finally said, I realize I'm not taking them for the pain anymore. I'm taking them to treat the withdrawal. And he was fortunately able to stop. Um, so again, it's a, it's a disease. It's not a moral failure. We have to treat it that way. And then addiction. We like to talk about substance use disorder now. We have to destigmatize this. Calling people addicts is very harmful. Um, I talked, you know, I, I had a, I worked in a, a homeless shelter for adolescent use for a while. You know who the kids were? The sons of teachers, doctors, nurses, and daughters. Um, your kids and my kids. We're, if you don't have this in your children, you're lucky. Anyone can have it happen. So we've got to realize this is something we need to treat with compassion um, and treat. So again, back to the no silver bullet. This is something that came out of ASTO, which is an organization Kara and I were part of for a while. Um, and uh, Claire, you did a good job about talking prevention, community prevention, education, whether it's training health professionals, all that stuff. It's great. It's not enough. You train a medical student now, you're not going to see them go into practice for 12 years. You train a resident, you've got three to eight years. Important, critical, not good enough. Youth prevention programs, community-based, do work. Um, SAMHSA supports a number of those. Um, the surveillance and monitoring, prescription drug monitoring programs, that we need to have a lot more teeth in these. Uh, docs can be com almost completely non-compliant with them with very little consequence. And so we're hoping there's more teeth in them. We also have a separate one in every state. We need a national system that is interoperable because people go state to state to, to get their drugs. This is where we focused for so long on law enforcement. We, call, we thought this was a, we had a war on drug. You know what we did? 
filled our prisons. So you look at why the women, or many women are in prison, uh, drugs, and often those are nonviolent crimes. The war on drugs didn't work. And I don't mean to say there's not some bad actors that, that need, who are violent or harmful, that don't need to be taken care of, but it is not the primary way to deal with this. We have such a shortage of treatment. We were just talking about this in Arizona. Everywhere is a shortage of treatment. In fact, when I tried to expand methadone in Vermont, the commissioner of corrections, who's actually a sociologist, said, uh, a social worker said to me, look, I can't offer treatment in corrections. I can't offer treatment in prisons because there's no treatment outside of prisons. So if we offered it, people would be getting arrested to come into prison to get their treatment. And that, frankly, is true. People will do that to get treated. They're so desperate. Oh, wrap up. Recovery, again, you can't treat someone for 30 days, bring them back, put them in the same environment, and expect them to not use prescription. The entire society around them is going to push them back into it. So quickly, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on here. If I were in philanthropy, I would say treatment and recovery. There's not enough going on there, particularly recovery, creating a safe place for people to recover. Not enough going on in community prevention. Um, Quickly, nail nail abstinence syndrome. We are seeing the skyrocket. Baby is born where the mom has been using an opioid or frankly a benzodiazepine or something else, and the baby is in withdrawal. Now, the, the status of this in the past, and I know there was someone here from Tennessee, is you'd rip that baby away from the mom, send them to foster care, and I think you talked about this, and you send the mom to jail. What have we done? We've just made this a intergenerational problem. It's the wrong thing to do. There are good programs where the mom can safely identify, you can wrap them around with treatment, support, and social services. And when the baby is born, you wrap it around the mom and the baby. The idea is you keep her in recovery, you give her the support she needs, and you have an intact family. Remembering, of course, it's a chronic disease, and that will, you know, doesn't, you need to stick with it. That, I think, is probably the best place for philanthropy to go, because you'll be saving a life immediately. You'll be saving that baby's life if they don't go to corrective. Uh, you, t you said eight minutes. It was too cool. All right, I'll stop. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'll stop there. We talk more about it. But I'd love to talk to you about needle apps. You know, because I think it's the most immediate place you can go to do good. Thanks. I gave Dr. Jarrett an impossible task. I gave Dr. Dallas an impos impossible task of eight minutes, so I apologize for that. And now Dr. Christ has eight minutes to tell us about Arizona and what Arizona's done. So thank you, Dr. Christ. All right. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Wonderful. Well, it's such an honor to be here. I know that I'm only one of 50 states that are struggling with the opioid epidemic. All of us are dealing with it in one way or another. Um, I'm the director for the Arizona Department of Health Services, and we have an interesting structure under Governor Ducey here in Arizona. Um, Governor Ducey has five major priorities that deal with what he believes are important, and it was things from a 21st century education to healthy and happy citizens, a efficient government, and he developed a structure called Goal Councils. And um, I am also the chair of his Goal Council, Healthy People, Places, and Resources in Arizona. And what this Goal Council does is it identifies specific things that we want to improve in Arizona that impact people, places, and resources, and the health of those. And, and each Goal Council was, does, was asked to come up with a breakthrough project, something they wanted to see a significant improvement on that would impact Arizona's health. And the Goal Council, which we refer to as Goal Council 3, decided that the opioid epidemic was going to be the breakthrough project that we wanted to improve for Governor Ducey. Based on that, we started measuring data. So what I think a lot of states are challenged with is there's no good data in the opioid epidemic. Um, just like this slide that was shown, you see you can find deaths through death certificates and through surveillance programs, but you don't really know what's going on real time in Arizona. We gave uh, Governor Ducey a report that was for um, uh, the, the number of deaths in 2016, and it showed the opioid epidemic. This report was released in June of 2017. Our 2016 death data was still not final. Our death data and our hospital discharge data, which was the main driver of Arizona opioid data, lagged six to 18 months behind.
And if you know public health and how we deal with crises and epidemics, we rely on real-time data to be able to do that. What we saw in um, June of 2017 for the year of uh, 2016 was that we had reached our highest point of opioid-related deaths in Arizona ever. We were at almost 800 deaths, which resulted in two Arizonans dying per day in Arizona. We had been doing a lot of activities, and we were already seeing for 2017, we were on track to meet or exceed 2017's, or 2016's numbers. Based on that information and that report, Governor Ducey declared a state of emergency and gave us a public health declaration of emergency as well. And what that allowed Arizona to do under the public health statutes and laws is it allowed us to collect real-time data. And so, as we would in an Ebola epidemic, in an influenza epidemic, we were able to identify what data points we needed to, to make it reportable within 24 hours. And then the governor also, in his declaration, um, required the department to do many other things in order to help combat the epidemic. But um, you can see that we got real-time surveillance data. So by our statutes, people are hospitals, healthcare providers, law enforcement, medical examiners, first responders were required to report all suspected opioid deaths, all suspected opioid overdoses, all babies born with suspected um, neonatal abstinence syndrome, the number of naloxone doses administered pre-hospital, and then the number of naloxone doses that were distributed by pharmacies, because that was a new legislative um, uh, initiative that had been passed in the legislature that year. This was so we could get an idea on what was going on in our community so that we could target interventions. Um, and as you can see, this was um, last week's report. We've had almost 3,300 overdoses reported in Arizona since June. June 15th of this year, um, we've had almost 500 deaths due to opioids reported in, um, since June 15th. And you can see that we've had, um, this number's actually increased, and we've had almost 300 babies born with neonatal abstinence syndrome. We post this data real time, along with more background and more um, more detail-oriented data on our website. It gets updated every week. Um, but that really gave us the ability to kind of pinpoint where our interventions were. The other thing that he asked us to do, though, was to develop emergency opioid prescribing and treatment rules. We license all healthcare institutions in Arizona, so that would be all hospitals, behavioral health facilities, outpatient treatment centers. And what we asked our healthcare facilities to do was to develop policies and procedures for treating and prescribing people with opioids. So we say that they have to implement either the Arizona Opioid Prescribing Guidelines, the CDC Prescribing Guidelines, or any other nat nationally accepted guidelines for opioids. They have to tell us how they're going to do that. They have to provide written informed consent on the dangers. They have to have written informed consent if they're going to co-prescribe benzodiazepines with an opioid, and a number of other things that we felt we needed healthcare institutions in Arizona Arizona to do in order to keep patients safe. The other thing he asked us to do was to work with first responders and law enforcement to get them trained up and carrying and being able to administer naloxone. Because in Arizona, a lot of times, our law enforcement agencies are the first on the scene for opioid overdoses. So since then, we have covered 85% of the state's population with law enforcement that is trained to administer and carry naloxone. And we, one of the barriers we identified was that law enforcement didn't have a budget to buy the first initial buy of naloxone. So we've set up a system where we buy the naloxone, the first set, and then we can get that replenished at, on scene for law enforcement so that it's a sustainable um, process moving forward. But in order to do that, we've ordered and continue to purchase but over 5,000 naloxone kits for local law enforcement agencies as that initial buy. 
We also updated our Arizona prescribing guidelines. We had issued initial prescribing guidelines in 2014. Um, CDC had come out with some guidelines, some of them we liked. Um, and what we did during this um, is we worked with all of our healthcare associations and provider organizations to develop a draft consensus guidelines that actually then were incorporated into rule. They'll be finalized by December of this year. But um, one of the things that we decided to do in Arizona was we don't ask people to do, consider, maybe think about not prescribing a co uh, benzodiazepine with an opioid. They are actually now very directive. Do not prescribe a benzodiazepine and an opioid at the same time. We give exemptions, but these are more directive and very to the point now. Um, we also issued statewide standing orders for naloxone, so um, that we, while we had legislative authorities that pharmacists could dispense without a prescription, we identified that um, the price was too high if insurance wasn't paying for it. Insurance wouldn't pay for it unless there was a prescription or a standing order, so we were able to do that. We also did a 50 state review of all of the best practices of the 50 states, and that's posted on our website. And we looked at various things and um, identified barriers and gaps, and then looked to see what other states and other organizations were doing to address those, and then we put them in a review to which we utilized that, we disseminated it to our partners that were involved in the Goal Council. We brought over 400 stakeholders together um, over multiple um, meetings to develop the Arizona Opioid Action Plan, which was the final directive of Governor Ducey. And what this Opioid Action Plan um, was supposed to do was supposed to give the governor high-level recommendations of what we thought would help stop opioid overdoses and deaths. And you can see that we had some goals. So the goals were to reduce opioid deaths, to improve prescribing and dispensing practices, to reduce illicit acquisition and diversion of opioids, to improve access to treatment and to prevent opioid use disorder and to increase patient awareness. And each of those has one or two recommendations to go along with it. And there's a lot of different um, recommendations ranging from legislative options that address all of the other goals um, to establishing um, medical school curriculum so that prescribers come out knowing how to treat chronic pain, knowing how to manage opioid use disorder, um, but also then public service announcements to educate patients, having Governor Ducey engage with the federal government to identify some of those barriers that are federally um, inhibiting states' response to the opioid epidemic, providing a 24-7 call in line so that we have experts that are available to physicians who have patients with opioid use disorder so that they may not be experts in it, but our 24-7 call in line is, and they can call up and help manage either withdrawals or the, the effects of opioid use disorder. There's a lot and then also one of the other things was creating a youth prevention task force. One of the things that we're just doing is this is actually an action plan, not just a report. So we have a scorecard that we're monitoring with all of the data. We have a um, action item, like an action plan timeline, and we are monitoring that on our scorecard, reporting to the governor um, monthly on where we are with all of our activities. But we do maintain all of our data, the opioid action plan, and all of our recommendations and those action items at azhealth.gov slash opioid. So I'll turn it over. Excellent. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Chris. As you can see, the state plays an incredibly important role, uh, but there are some things that the federal and state government cannot do, and so we're going to hear from Alexa Eggleston about what one philanthropy is doing to try to tackle the opioid epidemic. Oh, so how do I get to... Good morning. It's great to be here this morning. Um, uh, I think in particular with a crowd of uh, fellow colleagues in philanthropy, you know, I think there's a lot of concern um, within philanthropy and then the few funders that do fund in this space and certainly in the broader world that philanthropy isn't really stepping up to the plate um, in the way that they should when it comes to uh, really responding to what's going on across the country. Um, 
with the addiction epidemic. And so um, it's really great to, again, to be part of this conversation and really have a conversation about um, some additional ways that uh, funders can get involved. Um, I think it's been exciting. Some of the partnerships that we have developed um, have been in partnership with local funders, state funders, um, but what we haven't seen is really another large national funder really step up to the plate. And so um, it's been great to be at the Hilton Foundation and be able to be in this position of leadership in hopes that um, our work, work will inspire, encourage kind of others to, um, to partner and get engaged in this important issue. Uh, my background uh, prior to joining the foundation was uh, in D.C. actually working at a federal policy level, really trying to get Congress um, and other folks to pay attention to this issue. And so um, when I kind of step back and, and look at where we are now as compared to when I came into the field almost 15 years ago, um, it's kind of amazing the attention um, that this issue is getting. And it's much welcome attention. Um, and so again, and I'm thrilled to be able to talk about the work again today very quickly. Um, the Hilton Foundation um, is a family foundation that was started by Conrad Hilton, the founder of Hilton Hotels, um, who left the bulk of his estate to the foundation um, when he passed away. And so um, we have six strategic initiatives, and one of those uh, strategic initiatives is the work that I manage for the foundation that is around substance use prevention and early intervention. Um, so just a quick snapshot, I guess I will say, of the Hilton Foundation's um, history of funding in this space. Um, this is a quote um, from Don Hubs, who really um, helped shape the initial strategic direction that the foundation took in the early 80s. Um, and when they were looking at priorities that, um, that were really pressing and important across the country, um, this quote speaks to the need that, that they saw uh, around substance use disorders. And I think the striking thing about this is that this was in the early 80s. So when he talks about this being an issue that all the board members in some way, shape, or form um, had been affected by, um, you know, I think it just speaks to um, the need to really pay more attention to this. Um, and as you can see, the total funding that's been allocated really since that time, um, a large chunk of that funding was for Project Alert, which is a school-based prevention program that still exists out there, um, uh, really intended for primary prevention. Um, but several years ago, the foundation shifted directions. Um, the board was really, we had a long uh, investment in that space, felt really good about the contribution that we had made. Um, but you know, I think as most boards do from, from time to time, really wanted to look at what else was happening in the field um, that was exciting, that was promising, and I think the Hilton Foundation really wants to be leaders and innovators and risk takers. And so they were, you know, I think looking for new ideas in terms of how we could continue to be a leader in this space, but really also push the envelope forward. Um, and that work um, is the work that I've been managing since 2013. And I'm going to dive a little bit into. Um, so this is uh, Dr. Steve Chapman. Um, he's been one of our colleagues um, through actually one of our initial partnerships, which was in philanthropy um, with the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. And so the work that we're doing right now um, is really focused on advancing early intervention in young people to prevent and reduce substance use disorders. Um, as I mentioned, um, when we launched this initiative in 2013, um, there was promising evidence, um, you know, some initial research studies that had been done around these models that can be implemented in health care and potentially other settings to really start to engage young people in conversations and understand what was going on um, in their lives in terms of substance use. Um, uh, Dr. Chapman is a pediatrician, um, as I mentioned, at Dart Dartmouth Hitchcock in New Hampshire, which is their largest system. Um, and then he talks about the need that he sees as a pediatrician and their interest in really doing more screening and early intervention um, for young people. And um, this is what he says. Like many primary care practices around the country, we were not screening for this. And that needs to be our starting point. It's always better to prevent or address this early on rather than waiting until it's a problem. Some patients need referral to treatment, but many are just experimenting and just starting to get in trouble. They're teetering on the brink, and that's exactly why we want to, why we want to talk to them about at this age. I and mean, I think it really underscores something that Dr. Jarris mentioned. You know, we have I think, a pretty good sense for what works in terms of primary prevention in this country. You know, so how do we prevent young people from starting to use alcohol and drugs early on? And a pretty good sense for what evidence-based treatment looks like. What we haven't done a very good job of at all is that gap in the middle. Um, we know that, you know, for most people, substance use disorders develop over time. 90% of people 
who develop a substance use disorder, it starts with use before the age of 18. So this is very much a pediatric onset issue, um, but yet we don't pay a lot of attention to it at all, um, particularly for those young people that are starting to use early on. And so for the most part, what we tend to do is really wait for people to crash and burn, or we kind of wait for crisis. We wait to get kicked out of school. We wait for the arrest. You know, we wait for all the you know, really awful things that happen when someone's life is spiraling out of control from a substance use disorder. Um, but we don't really have in place is these screening mechanisms and these early intervention approaches to work with young people when that use is starting early on. And that really is the heart of the work that and that we are trying to push forward as part of the Hilton Foundation strategic initiative. Um, the goals for the initiative that were outlined for the board are really centered around the screening and early intervention work. And so designed around how do we get healthcare practitioners and other uh, you know, kind of systems and providers that work with young people to have uh, more awareness about this issue, to understand um, the need for intervention. Um, a prong of the work is really focused on trying new approaches, kind of testing what a screening and early intervention looks like um, in these range of settings, um, supporting implementation, supporting policy change to make sure that, um, that these sorts of things can be funded. Um, and then finally, because it was a newer area, really wanting to do more to develop the evidence base, to develop learning, to develop the knowledge that we needed to be able to show the impact that just having a conversation with a young person um, in a healthcare setting, really addressing this substance use as a health issue, as you heard reference, as opposed to you know a moral failure, a criminal justice justice issue, that we've really got to normalize this conversation for young people so that if and when there is an issue, they have somewhere to turn. I think overwhelmingly when we talk to young people, and in particular young people in recovery, um, across the board they often say, I had no idea who to talk to. You know, my teacher knew that I was starting to fail, you know, the coach kicked me off the team. All these kind of things happen when young people are start, first starting to get um, in and have issues that are really these intervention points and I think missed opportunities to really head off addiction when it's starting. Um, this is a quote from Dr. Sharon Levy, who's really um, one of the early pioneers of the early intervention work that we're doing, who's based out of um, Boston Children's Hospital, um, where she really talks about the importance of this, you know, that if we um, believe that, you know, addiction is a brain disease and that this is a health and a public health issue, then that there is a responsibility of the healthcare system to address it as such. And that really centers around screening um, for this issue as part of routine healthcare and then developing responses to figure out how we work with that young person to reduce their use and hopefully, you know, stop altogether. Um, so the work that we are, the public health um, kind of framework or approach that we started with um, is an approach called screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. Um, this is an approach that was developed to reduce uh, risky drinking in adults in primary care settings. And as I mentioned, when the board was looking for new things to invest in and promising and innovative things, um, they came across a couple of, of, you know, really promising studies that talked about the utilization of this approach um, with an adolescent population. And so three components um, utilize evidence-based screening tools to identify use in young people. And um, what we know that clinicians are notoriously bad at predicting what young people, um, you know, who, who is using alcohol and drugs and how serious that is. And when left to their own clinical judgments, they miss a whole lot of young people. Um, and so really trying to have more routinized and standardized approaches um, to screening and identifying risky substance use in young people. Um, the brief intervention part is really just a conversation um, kind of rooted in you know this idea that we're not going to judge you this isn't a bad thing but we really need to talk to you about what's going on with you and I think hopefully get at some of the root causes um, in particular with young people and why they start to use alcohol and drugs and I think that's been a, another real missing conversation particularly when it comes to prevention and young people you know kind of shifting from just saying no to really just say why you know that there are very legitimate reasons that a lot of young people become involved in alcohol and drugs and a lot of those reasons stem from very difficult, um, you know, I think adversities and other things that are going on in the life of the young person that need to be dealt with in order to deal with the substance misuse. Um, and then finally, the referral to treatment part. Um, we know that there are, you know, a small number of young people that have progressed to um, having an addiction, that need treatment services. And so for those young people, like we have in other specialty models in healthcare, how do we make sure that providers know where to send those young people and their families to get the clinical services that they need? Um, 
And again, another quote from one of our partners in, in New Hampshire that's been doing this work. Um, you know, I think that people want to have this conversation, but because of the lack of education that was touched upon, whether you're a social worker, a nurse, or a physician, a nurse, a physician, you don't really know how to have this conversation. And so, you know, you hear doctors say, I ignore it, I lecture, or, you know, <laughs> I don't know what I do. It depends on kind of the mood and, and how I'm feeling that day. Um, and the providers really want to take this on. I think increasingly there is recognition um, that uh, this is an issue a legitimate issue for healthcare. So our roots, I need to move quick. Um, you know, we are working across the country, so you can go to our website and see this map. Um, I will talk to anyone who wants to talk about this and is interested about whether this is in their community or what it might look like. Um, quickly, they wanted me to talk about some of the things we're funding um, to get at the issue of the lack of education in, um, in you know, most uh, kind of uh, the professional, I guess I want to say, um, uh, schools, and we've developed this work that's actually using avatars um, to train students. This is focused actually on um, social work students and nursing students on how to do this work. You know, how to screen, how do you have these conversations that are very much rooted in kind of self-motivated decisions about um, managing the use in a, uh, in a kind of healthier way. Um, we're doing a lot of work in school-based health clinics. Um, in an effort, again, to kind of bridge that gap um, between uh, health and substance use. And so, um, you know, school-based health clinics have become this kind of natural place to think about how do we implement this as part of routine care. Um, and ultimately, this is my last slide, you know, I think for us, this is about systemic change. You know, I think for all of our work, we work really hard on thinking about what are the policy implications of the work and the systems that we're operating within. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think for us, it really is, um, you know, an opportunity to change the way that we address substance use, particularly in young people across the country, so that we're not waiting again for crisis until we do something, that we're really intervening when problems first start so that we have a better result. And thank you. Well, thank you to all three of you. You could easily speak for two hours on each of these topics and share a wealth of information with us. So we really appreciate you trying to synthesize that down. Um, I hope that that was helpful to hear the role kind of from a big picture about the federal government, the state, and then where philanthropy can play a role. I know each of you are different in your geographic focus and also your funding priorities. So I thought we could turn now, um, probably just for a few minutes, so we can have Q&A with you to talk with each of these individuals here about the role that they think philanthropy can play. What is the highest impact role of philanthropy? So Dr. Jarris, I'll start with you, with your national uh, perspective. It would be very helpful to hear. What are kind of the two or three things you think philanthropy could do to augment what the federal and state government um, governments are doing? Um, again, I would go back to uh, where can you make the most impact? And it really depends on how you want to define what impact means. I, I do certainly agree that if you're looking in the long term, these youth uh, prevention programs, especially community gates, really work, and you'll affect a generation to come in the future. Um, it also, though, would be helpful to figure out of those people who already engage with substance use disorder, how can you impact that um, in, in the best way? Um, and I would. Uh, go back to the, the one of the reasons physicians don't screen is because what do you do if you screen positive? Where do you send them? There isn't enough treatment. I don't know that you would get engaged in treatment, <clears throat> but you know, handling that, what we need to develop a system is that when somebody needs treatment, they can actually get it and get it very quickly and in a comprehensive fashion. Um, among the priorities politically, women and children are going to be the highest priority, uh, just the way the system works. Um, and so I, again, would say that that's an area where not only can you save lives immediately by getting a woman into allowing, is building systems and models where there could be a safe identification without fear of being incarcerated uh, or, or immediately having your baby taken away, where there's treatment wrapped around the mom, support wrapped around the mom, social services, and then when the baby's born, making sure that gets wrapped around the mom and the baby to keep them together. Um, that, you know, then can result in a family that's maintained together, a mom who can go into recovery, a kid who doesn't go to uh, protect child protective services. Um, and I mean, I saw in the shelter, I saw a lot of those kids, they graduate from 18, and you know where they go? Prison. 
they had no so if we can keep families together that would be so important so i'd say that's an area that's a high priority and we need a lot of help in this country building those models uh, the other problem that for government there is that there are many things that are provided but they're all siloed with different funding streams so to actually bring them together is very challenging and the things you would support and programs you would support wouldn't have those same challenges and perhaps could be adopted by health care throughout the country communities throughout the country so I, I think it's a, a real priority for immediate effect in saving lives and a need great thank you so much and dr. Chris especially with you the just coming up with those recommendations for the state of Arizona after all the work you've done digging into the problems and how the state can address it have you uncovered areas where the state simply doesn't have enough resources and can't focus that you think philanthropy could step in and and do something either to support where you have identified or, or areas where you're just not going to be playing a role because you simply can't Absolutely. So um, in Arizona, as we develop those recommendations, I, I mean, I would, I would completely echo uh, with what Dr. Jarrah said. Um, there is a lot that public health can do, but the public health can always utilize more resources and utilize more funding. And so there are areas that you can have a big impact in um, where, where state government and the federal government just can't play a role. Um, some of the things that, that we identified is we would love to get education out to the general public. A lot of people don't understand that they may actually be on an opioid because it's called something different, or they don't understand what naloxone does. But in order to do public service announcements, you have to have funding to do that. And again, federal funding and state funding a lot of time comes with very specific instructions. And, and working with TV <laughs> stations to get a PSA on isn't always one of those. So some of the gaps that we identified where we're trying to identify funding opportunities would be things like funding PSAs, getting it out to the edge, you know, getting education out to the community, keeping wraparound services, the, the additional services around those moms and those recovering from um, uh, opioid use disorder. Um, and, then, and then interesting projects. So like I said, we're trying to develop a 24-7 call line for our physicians. Well, we fund, um, we fund call lines for certain things that we get line items for, funding for, but we don't have funding for this. So this is either an ask to the legislature to determine among the many priorities what are they, or we have to find the funding from some other pro program. And so those types of innovative projects that can have a big reach and big impact may be an opportunity to provide additional resources. Great, thank you for that. And then Alexa, given the fact that the Conrad Hilton Foundation has worked in this area for so long, um, and you work nationally, it'd be helpful to hear, do you see spe specific things philanthropy can do that vary by state, or do you see themes um, where everyone could do essentially the same thing, customized for their own location? Yeah, I think it's a combination of both. I mean, I think to echo um, what both Paul and Kara talked about, I think certainly, you know, I think one of the frustrating things about being in this field is that there hasn't been much philanthropic support. And so our innovation still comes from the feds. It still comes from the state government agencies. And, you know, I think as Kara was saying, their hands are so tied in so many ways. Um, you know, when I was in DC, it was you were always responsible to the latest crisis or the latest congressional request or the latest administration request and there's so little long view that happens there's so little big picture view and so you know I think for philanthropy to really take that perspective and I think in that public private partnership role I think that's some this is a complaining session but you know, my frustrations out but I think the other frustrating thing that hasn't happened is that you know big national public private partnership um, where we can bring all the philanthropy together and bring together all these you know different players um, to really get at some of these solutions and who does what and so you know I think that's something that's happened in the past that, that I would love to see happen and so there is this convening and this collaboration role um, that I think also philanthropy can play um, whether it's at the state level um, I was actually in Montana a couple weeks ago, and the Montana Healthcare Foundation, you know, was taking on this role of convening, um, you know, primary care, addiction providers, public health, the state folks to really talk about what does an integrated system of care look like for this state. I'm doing some incredible work with tribal communities on reservations, and so it was just such a great conversation to be part of because you really had everyone there represented, kind of steering this collective vision um, for what they want their communities to look like. Um, so I think also innovating. I mean, that's another thing that you know you often 
in here, well, if it's not evidence-based, we can't fund it. Um, and if, it's, you know, if you don't start somewhere, how do you get to an evidence-based? You know, if there's no one willing to take a risk and test new ideas, and I think that's something with the, you know, the early intervention work that we're doing, we're really trying to build that evidence base. You know, we're taking a risk. I think we're really trying to push the envelope in terms of how we respond to these issues. And I think it's some stuff that's not so terribly sexy. The infrastructure stuff, the workforce, um, you know, I think, and those are issues that can be addressed through policy and advocacy to the extent that folks are, are comfortable and have boards that are comfortable with that sort of work. You know, I think it's another piece of this that hasn't been funded in the way that, you know, other public health crises or other health issues have been funded. And, and we're really suffering because of it. You know, I think, you know, again, Dr. Jarris, that this has been the perfect storm. Um, you know, we have not paid attention to addiction in this country. And unfortunately, it is taking way too many lives um, being lost and families really destroyed um, to do that sort of stuff. Um, but there's optimism. <laughs> I do want that. You know, there is reason to be optimistic. And I think, you know, finally, you know, some of the emphasis on really supporting people in recovery. You know, I think one of the most exciting things I've seen happen in the last 15 years has been the rise of the recovery community. You know, people willing to speak up and out about, you know, not even just their own personal experience, you know, their spouse getting into recovery and what's that meant for their economic situation, the health of their family. Um, you know, those sorts of things, again, are newer areas that, you know, that the feds can only do so much around um, and just are really, I think, ripe for investment um, that would pay dividends, you know, over the long term. Excellent. I want to reinforce what Alexa said. In state government at the federal level, if you want to innovate, you go to philanthropy. <laughs> government does not fund innovation. Uh, evidence-based, in order to become evidence-based, it takes about 10 years of study. So the federal government funds ideas from 10 years ago. Uh, we need you to come in and help us develop these models, but not just do it in this community and that community. Do it in a way where we build the model, the evidence base for it, and then develop a way to spread it. The only other thing I say about evidence base is so often we'll get these evidence based programs and they will only allow it to be done exactly the way it was studied. And that's not just the funders, that's also the people who came up with it. It was nurse family partnerships and repregnancy. And what the real, one of the innovations we really need is how do we take this evidence base and introduce it in this Latino community, this American Indian community, this African American community. You can't do that by saying there's only one way to do things. So you could help us so much in those areas.